I'm curious this morning, how many skiers or snowboarders do we have in the room today? Anybody? All right, lots of you. Can you believe it? Just five weeks uh, until the projected opening of the first uh, ski resort as we start the season with others opening quickly uh, after that. I mention that because if you've spent any time on the slopes, uh, then you should know what this rope represents. It's a boundary line for a skiing area. And there are plenty of warnings uh, for the consequences of crossing that boundary. I've seen signs everywhere on ski resorts that say, ski out of bounds, lose your pass. Uh, but that's only if you get caught, you know. And the ski patrol can't be everywhere. Well, folks, I, I think it's one thing to know what you're not supposed to do. It's a kind of another thing not to do it. Because let's face it, uh, when there's something that you want for, for whatever reason, maybe it makes life easier in the moment, or maybe it happens to feel good in the moment, or maybe it satisfies a perceived need in the moment, uh, sometimes you might be willing to cross that line. Well, a few years ago, toward the very end of the ski season, a large amount of snow, over a foot, uh, fell in the high country on about the 20th of May. And the allure of that fresh, deep powder called a lot of folks to the slopes that day, including yours truly. And because it was near the end of the season, there were several large areas that had already been roped off due to the you know, seasonal snow melt. Uh, but on that day, there was one area that looked especially nice, but it was still out of bounds, probably because of an abundance of caution of the ski area. But I kept watching as skier after skier went under the rope, uh, including this very nice couple that I had just rode the lift with. And so I decided, I, the powder's got to be worth it. And so I, I joined them. And wouldn't you know it, down at the bottom of the ridge was a ski patrol guy who was not a happy camper, and he confiscated my pass. I had gotten caught, and I felt a little bit bad. <laughs> but I think it was only because I got caught, because I really, really enjoyed the powder. And I have to confess this morning, uh, the problem with that kind of attitude, honestly, is that it can lead to continuing to ignore more and more boundaries. And, and that's why simply not just feeling sorry for getting caught will ever change anyone's behavior. You know, I think most of us here today probably have a pretty good awareness about what God says is out of bounds in our lives. I think we all know we're not supposed to lie, we're not supposed to cheat, we're not supposed to steal or do anything immoral or illegal. But honestly, I think there are times uh, when we know God has said, he said something is wrong or sinful, but we don't fully comprehend why that has to be such a big deal. And so we don't always feel compelled to live accordingly. So probably more than often than we would like to admit, we, we step out of the boundaries that God has established for us and for this world. And many times, I think we feel like, hey, I didn't get caught. And so we start to believe, you know, no foul, no harm. And if we ever do get caught, we usually feel bad only because we got caught, but not necessarily because we actually disregarded God's wisdom and his authority in our lives. But let me just be as clear as I can be today. Whenever you choose to disobey God, it puts you in a precarious place with him because it sets your life on a path other than God's. And what you and I are going to be looking at today is how we can make the necessary course correction whenever that actually happens. And it's something that the Bible calls repentance. Repentance. I want to welcome you all here today to Academy Christian Church, whether you're here in the room or whether you're joining us online at over at our West Side campus. Uh, last week, if you were here, we launched a series called Rudiments. And since that's not necessarily a very familiar word, we looked at some of the synonyms that went along with that, and we discovered foundations, core, essence, basis, bedrock, brass tacks, nitty-gitty, gritty, groundwork, substructure, support. 
And basically what I want to make sure we understand is that a proper understanding of the rudiments of your relationship with God is essential, it's vital, it's, it's critical, as we're going to see and hopefully as we have seen. And so we've been looking at five rudiments uh, that are really the rudiments of our faith, and they start with faith, and then repentance, and then confession, and baptism, and then holiness. But today our focus is repentance. And so I'm wondering, when you hear the word repentance, uh, what are your thoughts about what that actually means? And how, how does it apply to your life? Because I hope you know repentance is a very biblical word that literally means in the Bible to make a a U-turn, which of course drastically alters the direction of your life. And what it requires for that to happen is a reorientation back to following God and then sticking to his path rather than charting your own course. Now, our goal today is to better understand how significant the biblical principle of repentance actually is, because the Bible is very clear. It is a a rudiment of our relationship with God. We know that because in Hebrews chapter 6, that's as much as what the Bible says. It says, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, in other words, grow up in our faith, not laying again the foundation, the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God. Now, the word translated elementary teachings is the Greek word arches, which denotes something that is original. It's back at the very beginning. It's foundational. And these elementary teachings are comprised of basic spiritual principles that every new believer needs to learn and understand and practice. And so the writer of Hebrews, you notice there, is indicating that these elementary teachings of Christ, when they're understood and they're applied, they produce spiritual maturity. It's how we grow up in our faith. The problem is, though, I think that not enough Christ followers have a good working understanding of these elementary principles, which can uh, then hinder and, and stymie their walk with God. I mean, for those who haven't integrated these core truths into their faith, it's kind of like they're stuck in spiritual beginner's class, which honestly is almost what I've been feeling like prepping for this message. In fact, this past week, I I felt obligated to call and actually apologize to someone who years ago uh, approached me concerning the importance of repentance. And I got to be honest, I kind of just blew him off. And I see it so differently now. So let's talk about why repentance really is uh, a rudiment. And heads up, uh, we're going to be loaded up with lots of scripture today because really uh, repentance is so intertwined with the Bible's descriptions of not only how somebody becomes a Christian, but then how how they live as one. And one of the first things we see right off the bat is that repentance was really a hallmark of Jesus' teaching ministry. Now, for the first 30 years of Jesus' life, remember, he was relatively obscure and unknown. But after his baptism, that's when he began to really go public. And so we read in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it says, from that time on, and it was after his baptism, Jesus began to preach. And do you see what his message was there when he would preach? Repent. Change direction, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And that's the exact same message that he gave to his apostles whenever he sent them out to preach. And so let me just offer a little warning. Among those who are trying their hardest to live a righteous life, which a lot of people like that, you know, show up in church, the need for repentance is often considered as something for other people to do rather than themselves, as demonstrated by this very interesting interaction that Jesus had one day that we find in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Follow along in your Bibles on your device, or it'll be up on the screen. And it says, now there were some present at that time who told Jesus, brought onto his attention, the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Apparently, there'd been a massacre at the temple. Uh, Pilate was trying to make a point. 
Now, before we go on, I just need to clarify that neither scripture nor recorded history give any further details regarding either this event or the very next one that Jesus is going to mention, which means that they were probably local incidences that might have shown up in the Jerusalem Gazette that day, but didn't make it into recorded history, even though they were, they were events that Jesus' audience was very familiar with. And so then Jesus takes this information, and in verse 2, he answers and he says, hey, are are you thinking that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they happened to suffer that way? He says, "I, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? He says, I'm telling you, no. But unless you too repent, you will all perish. Now, obviously, both of these uh, tragedies were well known to Jesus' hearers. Two current events, a massacre on the Temple Mount and the collapse of the Tower of Siloam. And the same lesson was drawn from each one. Jesus is trying to be as clear as possible. Repentance is a requirement for everyone. None of us can expect any type of exemption. Jesus was trying to make the point that every person needs to repent. And so he was kind of saying, hey, rather than highlighting the misfortunes of others and and predicting judgment, you and I should focus on our own sin. And rather than assigning wickedness to the behavior of others, you and I maybe need to be examining our own heart, which, when done honestly, should result in recognizing That the very best thing that you can do for yourself when you find yourself going the wrong direction is what? Change direction. You know, the famous baseball player Yogi Berra is credited with some hilarious remarks that he made over his career. And once he was actually driving to the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York with some other players. And after passing the exact same landmark three times, Uh, Another of the famous players with him that day, Joe Gary Giola, had to say, finally, Yogi, you're lost. To which Yogi replied, yeah, I know it, but we're making good time, aren't we? (laughs) Some people, including you and me, bite me making great time headed in the wrong direction, away from God, because we've never repented. And so what what does that mean? Well, true repentance takes place when... Because of your faith and trust in God, you acknowledge his sovereignty over you, and then you reorient your life in his direction. And the reason this has to start with faith is because if you don't possess a faith that believes God is ultimately in control, you're not ever going to want to fully surrender your life to him. And repentance requires surrendering to God's authority over your life. So remember, faith isn't just saying, hey, I believe in God. It's saying, because I believe he's God, I'm going to trust him. And until you settle the issue of who has authority over your life, you are going to struggle spiritually. You will. That's why the Apostle Peter, when he was preaching to some folks uh, in the book of Acts chapter 3, he tells them, he said, hey, you, you need to repent, change the direction of your life, and turn to God So first of all, your sins can be wiped out, and then times of refreshing can come from the Lord. Now, with that in mind, can we all just recognize that there is a big difference between simply recognizing sin and repenting of it? It's a a big difference. I actually think there could be some people who quite possibly believe they've made a decision to follow Christ, but have actually never repented, repented. And that's because all they've done is simply acknowledge and recognize their sin. And they're just glad that there's a possibility they could be forgiven. But repentance isn't just acknowledging sin and then regretting it. It's recognizing that when you sin, you're you're headed in the wrong direction. And then reorienting your life to move in God's direction. I think that's what Paul was really describing when he talked to the believers in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Notice what he says. He says, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and actually leaves no regrets. Worldly sorrow, just feeling sorry because you got caught, brings death. And then he says, see what this godly sorrow has produced in you. And look at the list. What 
earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. Those are the kind of responses that true repentance produces. You see, people who simply have a religious mindset, they're the ones who just kind of regret breaking the rules. But people who follow Jesus, they repent because of the disrespect they've shown to their heavenly father. See, it's not about religion, it's about relationship, which is why repentance in essence means getting back in sync with your heavenly father. And so repentance leads to internal congruence with God rather than simply external conformity for him. I think some people believe that they can fool God and others simply by putting on a show or by showing up. And that's why Jesus, in Mark chapter 7, uh, he replied, and he said, you know, Isaiah was right when he prophesied uh, about these hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips. There's external conformity. He said, but their hearts are far from me. There's no internal congruence. I've told you the story before, but I think it's a lot uh, like the little boy whose mom decided she was going to make him sit in the, uh, the corner in some time out. And she happened to be walking by, and he glanced back at her, and he looked at her, and he said, Mom... I might be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. I think he got more time probably to think about that. See, external conformity is not what God is seeking. And congruence internally happens when we adjust our hearts to God's perspective. It's acknowledging and saying, hey, God, your way is the right way. And so in a way, repentance is, is, is a little like taking yourself out of the driver's seat of your life and letting God sit there. It's like the meme I saw a while back, which is so true. It says, if God is your co-pilot, swap seats. Put him in charge. Don't even have him as your, your co-pilot. And folks, I, I think that's why if you ever try to improve your behavior, which we all have, without repentance it's not going to work very well. And so if you happen to be struggling with a repetitive sin, it, it, it could be that all you've experienced is just some regret rather than true repentance. Because repentance is a change of heart and mind that results in a change of behavior. And that's what the Apostle Paul was saying in Acts chapter 26. He was talking about, he, I was preaching and what it was accomplishing. He says, first in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and, and turn to God and then demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. See, I think the way to know if, you, if you've repented of a specific sin is when your behavior changes. That, that's when you can know. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes the change might, might have to kind of transition or, or, you know, kind of come in sections, be gradual. I'll never forget a young lady I met back in Iowa when I was pastoring there. Her name was Melinda. And she came out of a really dark experience of life into drugs and alcohol culture and was just in some really dark places. And so when she was transformed into a Christ follower, um, she had a mouth on her. She could say words that I was... Ooh, I was kind of surprised to be able to hear. But she had repented and oriented her life towards God. And so what would happen is she was so used to it, she would say the word, and then she would catch herself and say, oh, that's not what I want to say. And then after a while, she would, she would get to the point where it would be before she would say the word, she would catch herself, and then she would stop. And then after a while, she didn't even have to think about it any longer. But that's because she, she actually repented. Now, something I think we all need to be aware of, unfortunately, is that becoming a Christ follower doesn't make you immune to sin. I wish it did. That would help a lot. But folks, that's why every New Testament writer gives us some instructions about the need for Christ followers to intentionally adjust their behavior to match God's direction. So in Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13, Paul writes and says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation but it's actually not to the flesh to live according to it. Because if you live according to the flesh, you'll, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. 
And one of the things I'm so painfully aware of, and I'm pretty sure you are, is that your body is going to keep telling you that you have an obligation to satisfy it. And you know, that's actually one of the reasons why fasting can be such an important spiritual discipline, because it's really telling your body who's in charge and what's most important, and it's not it, it's spiritual things. And here's why repentance has to be a rudiment. It's because intentional, continual sin is really incompatible with new life in Christ. Now, I want to just say, if you're not yet a Christ follower and you're just here checking it out, I mean, obviously your, your behavior matters, but it's not a big deal yet because you haven't decided to follow Christ. If you're a Christ follower, that actually is a big deal. And somehow the church is going to have to figure out how we, we got to start trying to tell the world how it's supposed to live and start living actually how we're supposed to live in repentance. And the key words here are intentional and continual. If you intend to continue to sin, there's not been true repentance that has reoriented your life towards following God. Unrepented of sin is really one of the major causes of repetitive ungodly behavior in a person's life. Because honestly, honest, there's a big difference between that's not how I want to live as a Christ follower and whew, at least I know I'm forgiven. And so the Apostle Paul, when he writes to the Ephesians, he says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Very simply, he's, he's stating that believers will not continue practicing sin as a way of life, but because there will be a difference between the old life without Christ and the new life with Christ. And so the Christ follower who has a habit of stealing no longer engages in theft. And the Christ follower who might have been an adulterer has now broken free from the old life of immorality. Repentance is truly understanding that when it comes to sin, I need to stop it because now I'm seeking to live in obedience to God. And until that's your pattern of thinking, Maybe you haven't gotten to repentance yet. And do you know who has the hardest time, I think, repenting? <laughs> it's religious people. Because, you know, religious people think that they can be good enough, and if they're good enough, then it will compensate for whatever they've done wrong. But the Bible is already pretty clear. The wages of sin is death. And it's never been that you can compensate for your sin by being good enough. Only Jesus could pay your sin debt. He's the only one. And so repenting of sin, it's not about earning your relationship with God. It's about a course correction because you want to be with God that causes you to stay spiritually connected with God. Now, I got to be honest, one of the technologies I'm so grateful for today is GPS. Aren't, aren't you? I mean, it stands for Global Positioning Service. And I'm so amazed that on my phone, it can receive a, a signal from satellites orbiting above the earth that triangulates my latitude and longitude and my altitude uh, and, and identifies where I am to within inches of where I am. And then it's actually able to give me precise directions for where I need to go. Lord, thank you so much for GPS. Because some of you, do you remember how we used to have to do it? We had a paper map in the glove box. We had to take out and open up, probably pull over and stop, or drive dangerously with the map in front of you, <laughs> and try to figure out the way to get there. Um, but GPS just tells you exactly where to go, right? <laughs> so let me ask, how many of you have ever ignored the directions your GPS was giving you? Don't raise your hand. Because <laughs> if you did, you know, what you, you know what you heard? I heard it a lot of times. Route recalculation. When you get to the next intersection, make a U-turn. I wish I had a dollar for every time my GPS has told me to make a U-turn. And now it's even better. Not, not only can I see it on the screen where I need to go, but thanks to my watch, I get the added assistance of a gentle tap on my wrist that it's time to make the turn. How many times have you and I 
ignored the direction God has given us because he doesn't want us to get lost in his world. And do you know where those directions are found? They're found in the Bible. You know the Bible is our spiritual GPS. It's God's positioning service, our spiritual guidance system. It helps us identify where we are in relationship with God. And that's why I love what it says in Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young person or anybody of any age, how can they stay on the path of purity? It's by following the directions, living according to your word. And along with scripture, God has also provided to believers the Holy Spirit, who often, I think much like that watch, provides a gentle thumping, uh, giving me a nudge. You need to move in God's direction. And I have a choice. I, I can acknowledge that gentle tapping and I can follow directions or I can ignore them and get detoured in my relationship with God. Just recently, I was having an interaction with uh, my younger sister. And uh, our family right now, we're trying to provide care for our aging parents, which is an amazing challenge. And, and on this occasion, in, instead of giving my sister the benefit of the doubt because of an oversight on her part, um, I decided to actually text her a piece of my mind. I let my thumbs go. I at best. And shortly after that, I just so happened to read in the Bible where Jesus said, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And then I, my spirit, I heard my spirit is saying, Brian, is, is that the measure you want used to you? And then, if that wasn't enough, I was reminded of how Jesus gave the benefit of the doubt, if you remember, to the very ones who were executing him, who had nailed him to the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. He loved them in spite of themselves. And that's when I actually recognized I, I needed to repent. And I need to say, you know, before I give people a piece of my mind, isn't that what we want to do? If I'm going to be like Jesus, I need to make sure that I've first given them some of my heart. And I'm wondering today, is there any area of your life where you've never really agreed with God that it's wrong and that you need to stop doing? Maybe it's gossip, maybe it's lust. Maybe it's idolatry. It's putting other things ahead of God. And today would be a great day to make a move in, in the right direction. And I know there's a lot of people today and they're wondering why, why God's taken so long in sending Jesus back. Actually, Peter lets us in on that. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, he writes, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. The city's patient with you. He's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to what? Repentance. Repentance. I needed to come to repentance, to come to Christ, but I have needed to come to repentance a lot of times since then. See, biblical faith leads to biblical repentance, and biblical repentance, it gets even better, <laughs> leads to biblical confession, which we're going to take a look at next week and again God has really convicted me of the power of all of these for my relationship with him to be where it needs to be and so this morning I just want to give us some time David's going to play for you just to bow your head and spend a couple moments with God asking him God, are, are we good? Or is there an area of my life that I haven't really surrendered to you? Because I'm guessing that's going to be the area that causes you the most trouble, that Satan uses the most powerfully against you. And the step we got to take is to 
acknowledge. Confess. Admit, God, that's not how I want to live. Take a moment. somebody here today who really just even haven't taken that first step that you're drawing them to. Pray there be some decisions today to follow Jesus through faith, repentance, confession, baptism, living a holy life. Because that's, that's where the joy, that's where it lives. And we want to live in that place. We ask and pray that in Jesus' name. 